Welcome to the Journeys Podcast. My name is Alexander Faubel and each week I bring you an inspiring person or story that can help you uncover your own true potential. We deal with the question of what influence psychedelics play on the path to self-actualization and inner healing. We share experiences and present both traditional and modern mental health tools that can support you on your path to living the life your heart truly desires. Great to have you here with me today and now let the journey begin. This podcast covers topics that can touch on the subject of drugs. This format is purely educational and is not an invitation to use drugs. Furthermore, the use and or trading of drugs is punishable by law. This podcast is not suitable for persons under the age of 18. Be responsible, be safe and do your own research. Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to another episode of the Journeys podcast. My guest today is Jen Olson and she got introduced to me from a common friend of ours as another kick-ass woman you need to interview on your podcast. She's into psychedelics and does a lot of cool outdoor action-based stuff like mountain climbing and so forth. As you can imagine, it didn't take long until we were recording this episode together. So what you'll hear is another story of a brave person whose own personal struggle led to a first psychedelic experience and in her case with 5-MeO-DMT that ultimately changed the way she looked at herself in relation to the world and the work with these substances afterwards. As always, you'll get a brief introduction into Jen's upbringing and what led her to become the seventh Canadian female mountain guide, through which she was able to live a life filled with adventures and traveling to places like Alaska, Pakistan and Nepal for her expeditions. As a climber and mountain guide, Jen had lost friends and partners before, but in 2006 she had to survive the grief and loss of one of the most important people in her life, her own father, who died in a tragic car accident. And you'll hear her explain how this led her to find somatic experiencing as the most powerful way to work with her past and change her current state. Since somatic experiencing offers both a top-down cognitive as well as bottom-up nervous system approach to resolving traumas, she was really interested when she heard that psychedelics are also currently used in treating and transforming mental health. And in 2020, she then had her first 5-MeO DMT experience herself. And you'll hear how it felt like to have a complete dissolution of her own self and how this experience helped her to work with the grief and the loss of her dad's passing. I'm really, really glad we got the chance to have this chat. And when Jen is looking into her own future, she sees her dream become a reality to bring both somatic and psychedelic assisted therapy into one system. And I wish her all the best for that because I know she will help a lot of people with this. So another journey that tells the story of a person who was able to use her own pain and transform it into something to be of service for others. Enjoy this episode and feel free to reach out to Chen for a chat if you like. I'm looking forward to having you back here next week and until then, be yourself. Jen, um, nice to have you on this recording. Really look forward to that. It's been quite a few weeks since we tried to make that happen. So I'm really, really happy that we can do this now. And we just had a quick chat and I don't want to keep you longer than needed because you live in Canada and it's beautiful weather outside and you're, you like to ski today. That's what you showed, uh, told it's me. It's a powder day. Powder day. <laughs> <laughs> But all the way from Canada, so lovely to have you here. And a good dear friend of, of ours, Jana, who was also on the podcast before, put us in touch. And she basically just told me that, Alex, there's a kick-ass woman. You need to have her on the show. That was more or less what she said. And I said, like, I, I need to interview ki more kick-ass women. So please bring her on. And that's how we got in touch. And I immediately thought after you sent me a little bit of your background notes and like where are you in life and like the, the kind of your own individual path towards where you are now, I thought, wow, not sure if we can fit all of this in one recording, but we'll try because this is so interesting and a lot of people would love to hear that story, me included. So when I normally start asking people, okay, do you want to just share a little bit about your background journey? And if I ask you this question, this would just probably take up like five hours. So like this format is called journeys because I want to highlight that people in the individual perceived way have had their own experiences that led them to, let's say, a more inner knowing of who they really are and what they want to do and how they 
they show up in the world and what i always like to to call out is this this knowledge of their inner personal truth their authentic self however you want to call it but to to help people understand that life is not a linear line and like there's ups and downs and all of those pathways can lead you to a place where you are at one point then reaching a, a moment where you feel like wow all of what happened before needed to happen for me to really be in this particular moment and i feel as complete or as much as myself as i've never been before to me personally i'm still on that path and i'm feeling more and more aligned with that truth which is why i'm also having this kind of format to talk with people about it but maybe with that in mind can you give a brief overview of who you are what you do for a living maybe and then before we touch the psychedelic part of of your your journey because that just came came up a little bit later in your life due to certain circum mm -hmm. circumstances but maybe up to that point what happened like how did your life form and because it's not a traditional one that you that you lived so far yeah <laughs> thank you thanks for all that um so i grew up in calgary alberta canada And both my parents are from farms in Saskatchewan. And I like to mention that because I feel that the farming lifestyle somehow influenced me becoming a mountain guide without realizing it. And, but more or less, neither of my parents are into climbing and skiing the way I know it, <clears throat> but they were very supportive of their daughter's desires. And my mom really encouraged her daughters to become non-traditional females and um so through lots of synchronicities in my life i ended up in canmore and saw some climbers and thought they were really cool and then ended up taking a going to the university of calgary and taking climbing and skiing for credit and then worked for outward bound and eventually became a mountain guide which enabled me to travel the world and climb and ski and a huge passion of mine has been climbing. And so I've been fortunate enough to also get sponsored to do some various expeditions with other women in places like Pakistan, Alaska, Nepal, and in the Canadian Rockies, which is an amazing place um, to learn how to climb and to climb and ski. And so That's been a, an incredible life. And, um, but it's also, you know, all things have a shadow side. So there's also been a, a shadow side to it in terms of being on the fringe of community. And um, the way it worked out for me is I didn't have kids. And so just sort of always feeling, and, and, and the way I've chosen to work has kept me very transient too, because I like new and exciting experiences. So Yeah, just feels like I've lacked groundedness and connection and, and some meaning. So even though the mountains are really spectacular and awesome and mm -hmm. there's so many summits I've stood on and I've wished that my family were standing beside me. Um, I've now I'm in nursing school and I find that when I'm at a patient's bedside, they didn't choose to be there. And there's something about that that's I find really helpful just to be that person that gets to witness that um, those challenging times in their life. And it is, you know, you, I do feel like I'm of support when I'm helping people get up a mountain, but it's a different type of support. Yeah. Wow. So you've been living a life where you, you actually studied to be a professional mountain. I think you became the seventh Canadian female mountain guide. Is that what I remember mm -hmm. correctly? Yeah. Um, And so it was a pr pretty harsh training, I would assume. You just don't gonna be credited like you're now your official mountain guide. You have to do a lot of work to become that at one point, and there has to be a lot of determination that you actually uh, pursue that and then close that with a success at the end. And was it always a dream of yours to be up in the mountains because there was a calling that you had to to do this kind of thing? Where, where did this come from? Because if I imagine. A normal trajectory of a, a let's say quote unquote a normal person's life which is school university and then sitting somewhere in an office doing a normal quote unquote normal job this is super different to that 
from the beginning onwards, right? So what made, besides that, your mom always said that both of you should not be the traditional kind of females growing up. Was there something else that already told you if something with inside of you, I always wanted to do that, the mountains were calling me or something that of that nature? Well, that's where I get curious about the ancestry of farming and that mm -hmm. I think just experiencing wilderness and adventure and the unknown and maybe seasonal work and and like just that experience of doing something that's really hard and then having greater periods of rest. Yeah, I just think, I feel like there's something in that that called me. And then, like I said, there's just synchronicities, like what you get exposed to and what you desire. And um, yeah, so I feel like, for example, my meeting people, I didn't even know this was an option. And my my connection to figuring out that that was an option was making a phone call for a place to live. And I happened to call um, a, something called Mountain Equipment Co-op, which is a big outdoor retailer in Canada. And they were like, oh, we need a roommate. And so then I lived in a house with six people that were in the Outdoor Pursuits program at the University of Calgary. And so otherwise I wouldn't have even known it was an option. Mm -hmm. So I think that you're right. There's like there's different things in our ancestry or in our that call to us and then there's synchronicity and sort of being open to that yeah yeah such a fantastic word synchronicities if, you, if you're aware of that they exist and then you potentially see them everywhere it will dramatically shift and the way you perceive life and change it as well and so how how long have you been doing this then for like being a mountain yeah. professional mountain climb guide I got, I was fully certified in 2008 and mm -hmm. then, but I, I was actively guiding. I think I started guiding in Europe even quite a few years before that. And um, yeah, so yeah, I've just been, I've also just really loved travels and using guiding as a way to see places like New Zealand and mm -hmm. yeah, just loved it. So, <clears throat> so I guess um, it feels like around 25 years. Wow. Wow, because you, when you said that you somehow felt like you lacked a little bit of the groundedness, I can only imagine if you're always on the top of the mountains and like just on the, the highest points of this world and you always have you know, nothing but cloud, sky, fresh air and then of obviously there's some the element of earth potentially missing of keeping you on the ground and being rooted and having that potentially security feeling of calmness and, and something. that That's something I would imagine that might be missing in my case. Not sure if that's what you meant by lacking a little bit of the groundedness and yeah I think I think it can be an addictive lifestyle to mm -hmm. always be chasing the um like the say in climbing it could be a grade or a location or a or a, an, a certain adventure and um and I think too in our culture there's that um external recognition and Instagram and you know just I, I feel like for me, external recognition was a driver from some of that through some of that time. And then, and then I received it, which was quite good. And mm -hmm. then, then I realized I, that, okay, I've got my external recognition. I still am missing something. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was helpful. Actually, I almost think people should get their external recognition and then they can move on from that phase of their life or something. It's so great that you yeah. say that. Yeah, whatever the external <laughs> recognition is. I always say like, I wish people to earn millions as fast yeah. as possible. So they right. realize that's not the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that is a pivotal moment. And when you realize, shit, that's not it. That's not filling the cup more than it than I'd like to. Uh, mm -hmm. Damn. Okay, next week, still feeling empty inside. What now? Fuck. I know exactly what you mean. Even though you had this adventurous lifestyle already doing all of this for so many years and then leading people and potentially sharing with people so many beautiful memories and experiences and getting not just recognition in a way where uh, you, you're good at your job and you get paid for what you do in your service, but that connection with people that I would assume ha happens a lot when you do that intimate climbing exercise with people. And I mean, they trust you with their life potentially for that mm -hmm. matter. And yeah that bonding that happens between people that must be so so strong and so giving you such a great an appreciation of the kind of work that you do with people that this is something that when i look back in my own previous working environment i never had i always wanted to have deeper connection with people like never could 
like really voice it like what was missing i was trying to figure out what was missing and i just couldn't figure out what i was just it didn't feel right that's the only thing i came up with. it just doesn't feel right and i cannot tell you what it is it's just I, it's impossible for me which just kept going and going for years and years and eventually i just i said well I'm not going to find the answers to my questions if I keep a asking the same questions in the same environment. I need to some change something. And then for me, this meant quitting my job and doing a sabbatical year and just leaving and just traveling the world. And then, like you said, synchronicities happened and then just trusting that process, which led me to so many beautiful encounters with other people and places and brought me to where I am now. But it had to be taking me to a point where I felt I need to change something because otherwise it will at one point regret not having done it and for me the pain the image in my head of being at one point in my life where i look back and say fuck i regret that i've not done it that mm -hmm. was more painful to me than to just jump and you know live with whatever kind of fear anxiety i still had in my in my system so always the point that needs to come to right where yeah. this pivotal moment in your life where you say like fuck it i need to i need to change something something is not right and i guess for you there was a pivotal moment of that kind in 2006, if I remember, right? Yeah, and, and I think, um, I guess I just want to speak to one thing. So, because I still guide, and what I find, because I do think there's always what you do, and then it's how you do it. Mm -hmm. So when I guide, I can just be really focused on the objective of the physical skill or the physical summit or whatever that is. Or I can use it as a metaphor and or to help with people's inner working. So there's sort of like this external achievement of our physical abilities. And then there's sort of what is what's the internal process to get there. And now I find what I find really most rewarding in my guiding is helping people with their internal experience. Um, and so it's part of that's through the mental coaching I do with um, helping people work with their fear of climbing or fear of heights or and their their own limiting belief systems. and. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so, cause I think it is possible as a guide to not be connected to people to mm -hmm. kind of just be like, oh, we're going to the summit and, you know, just to make it all about the, the activity yeah. and not yeah. about the internal. Yeah. But yeah. So in, um, well, well just one, one question, Jen, yeah. on that, because you said for, for you, it's now it's more important to do the kind of inner journey with people than just the outward thing that helps with the other side of things. But I can only imagine that people come to you and when you do that mental coaching, what else is there besides the direct fear of climbing or heights, which might be obvious if you do such a thing for the first time. Yes. But is there other stuff that people might not be, even be aware of before they start the climb? And then in the middle of the journey, you've been talking with them about so many other stuff that came up, how freeing this might be to have such an experience where it's not just follow me, I'll bring you up to the summit, yeah. follow me and I'll... I'll take you deeper within and up to the summit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's something that I don't even have to do anything that mother nature does, you know, just by putting ourselves in these environments, it just helps us with our perspective. Cause I really can't imagine the perspective of someone who never leaves a city or whatever, mm. just, yeah, just opening, opening our minds. Hmm. <laughs> I'm I'm the biggest fan of Mother Nature. You can you can find so I know what that does, which is why I always and we talk about how psychedelic journeys or working with plant medicines, the setting is so important and can be a better setting as working with those plants in a natural setting where you're in surrounded by yeah. a forest, by a lake, by whatever it is. Yeah, but just having the healing power of nature itself uh, helping you. Yeah, with it. yeah. That ties into one of my my visions. That I don't know if we'll it'll actualize, <laughs> but yeah, but that's yes. definitely a business, a big business idea of mine. Amazing. But yeah, just a little sidetrack because that's super imp interesting to visualize that even though you're a mountain climber and you or mountain guide and climber yourself and you help people that want to be led towards a, a particular summit and then are really grateful for you leading them in that way. Um, I can imagine that the kind of gratification and the amount of positive feelings that you can get from that kind of work a lot of it might come from the dialogue with people the connection with people being close with them and go more deeper on a personal level than just i lead you to the top you pay me and i'll say goodbye right but um we chatted about that a little bit before as well so 
if you imagine doing a lot of those trips and helping a lot of people climb a lot of different and difficult situations, there might have been a couple of not so nice incidents where you might have lost people or or faced severe um, accidents or something like that. And that in itself must have been really hard to to work with and just to to cope with. And Mm -hmm. it's a major part, I I expect, of your individual journey as well, of why you do the stuff that you do now and what you want to bring out in the world. Maybe you can touch a little bit on that side of the work that you do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, loss is a big part of mountain communities. I think, I mean, loss is a part of everyone's life on this planet, but... um, I think in mountain communities, because people are so passionate about what they're doing, and then people sometimes lose their lives through Mm -hmm. avalanches and different accidents. So, um, so for me, one big loss I had was losing my dad in 2006 in a traumatic car accident. And, um, and so going through, there was sort of a, a big crisis I went through in discovering his death and and how that all played out and and then my response to that over the subsequent years like I feel like I was kind of numb in the first year and then eventually found my own healing with them and the most potent healing for me was somatic healing because just the nature of my upbringing I feel like we all have traumatic childhoods to varying degrees and I had my own and um and so my mom actually was proactive in sort of adolescence and having us do various counseling. So I've been exposed to sort of there are various types of therapy my whole life. And so in the healing of my coming through my dad's death, I ended up finding somatic therapies to be really effective. And so that led me on a journey of, and just trying to, I knew I've always known with guiding that that wasn't going to be my only thing. And I, and I get, I have been sort of made fun of a lot for having a lot of career interests and, um, which is fun. It's been fun. It's been a good life. I've learned so many things and um, that I know and I'm finding my way. And so in that, I started down this journey with somatic therapies like craniosacral, orthobionomy, and then um, really clicked with somatic experiencing. And I completed that um, certification and while I was doing that certification, I decided I didn't want to go into private practice. I wanted to be in the system. So Mm -hmm. then I determined that maybe nursing was going to be the best way to do that. (laughs) And, um, Oh, anyway, so, so, and then in that, I've also then discovered psychedelics. So, and what was cool for me about that was I actually was writing a paper on psychedelics. And listening to podcasts, like I'm just one of these voracious listeners and readers. And so I'm just getting all excited about it. And then I, um, I connected with some people that were working with um, 5-MeO DMT and decided that after, you know, if this had this in some ways in my mind, I determined that this was going to be my path, but I actually didn't have a lot of personal experience with therapeutic use of psychedelics Mm -hmm. and and also I, I find nursing school really challenging. And so I'm often questioning it. You know, I, I started in one nursing school and I got kicked out and <laughs> Are you too yeah, I, yeah, it was just, everyone's like, Oh, you skipped too much school, which is what I did in my first undergraduate degree of teaching. I skipped a lot of school to go do fun things. But this time I'm very, um, I, I'm very like, I want to do well. I'm a student, but I just, found things unacceptable and I called I said this is bullshit (laughs) (laughs) and this person is not cool and I spoke up and that didn't go over so well so I made enemies um, and learned about hierarchical power structures in academia and the medical system and yeah good learning and but it and and synchronistically it brought me to the West Kootenays where I have been exploring psychedelics more and more so Mm. um yeah, now, I mean, now psychedelic medicine is just blowing up and it just feels like becoming a nurse and having this passion is all all a part of my plan and, and um, it's all going to not be that difficult to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you said that, that you found somatic experience saying as a most profound way for you to deal with that specific trauma or trauma in general because you've done so many other things as well because... 
it kind of combines a more top-down cognitive approach with the bottom-up nervous system approach. If I imagine what you mean by that, and I can totally relate with it, is why I also think that the work with psychedelics specifically has such a profound effect on people is because it's such an embodied experience. It just is not just in the head. It's just not only cognitive. It's It goes down in your whole nervous system and connects both sides of the spectrum for people then to come out of it and say something like, I've never experienced such a, such a profound thing in my whole life. Um, is that the, the reason why you think it worked for you? Um, best absolutely yeah so i yeah i feel like i have have a lot of top-down cognitive understanding of psychological wellness and so for me somatic therapies work with the physiological part of ourselves that help us to regulate and you know and i have a this is going to be a lifelong learning just like all these things um but yeah i think that's why it's so profound is just because the trajectory of mental health in our world has been that we haven't worked bottom up so to to come in and work with soothing our nervous system and and just seeing how that affects our psychology and affects our life more profoundly than a cognitive understanding of where we're at and even all i think so many of these top-down therapies are amazing and i love learning about them like um internal family systems is one that stands out to me right now and I mean, so many different things. And then, but then to take them all and partner them with the somatic and the embodiment piece, like it's, that's what for me is becoming just profound and part of the work even within psychedelics. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know what, that's why psychedelics are so potent is because they, they allow us to go there. And so I think somatic experiencing allows you to go there, but it's just like, it takes longer, same with Mm -hmm. meditation or whatever. So it's like, it, it just helps you get out of your own way. That's what's showing up for me with this work. So true. And the way I always say it is, it's not that I don't use tools like meditation next to it or on top of it or all the fucking time. It's just an add on and it just gives you kind of an, a rocket booster if you need it to break down a couple barriers potentially or just have this somatic experience that is more or less guaranteed if you have a high dose and, and a potent psychedelic versus if you sit there in a meditation retreat for a week Great stuff can happen. It doesn't have to. If you're lucky, it does. If not, then not. But if you're actually working with a plant medicine like ayahuasca or having a potent psychedelic experience, there's a guarantee that something will happen. There's no way you will not have an experience on that. And right. um, this is why it's so profound, so potent, but also for a lot of people so terrifying. Why they, at least over here, when we talk with, you know, when I talk to people about it, is there's still a lot of not resentment, but a lot of caution when talking about it or just having a, the idea to work with those tools because there's so many fears still attached to, to yeah, working with fear. them. So much yeah. fear still, right? And why I love to, like normally how this goes, right? If, if you're on your own path and then you find, fuck, I'm stuck and I need to get out of this this hole, what, what does help me? I search for tools and nothing helps me and then I find one and it's so profound and so powerful that wow nothing else that i tried out before helped me in that way and then i can use this tool and then just go on and help others potentially that haven't experienced that tool itself to overcome that fear and anxiety maybe because you've overcome it yourself in a way and this is why i would also love to talk with people about in this in this recording is their personal experience that they had with those tools right and if you mentioned that what kind of nursing school led you being rebellious in that in your nature and then getting kicked out and then this also helped with the connection with psychedelic work and then you had an experience with 5-MeO-DMT which is and we had a recording on that topic before here is probably the most potent substance you can actually consume that gives you a really short psychedelic experience which is not i've never done it personally myself so which is why i'd love to to get your insight on it but from what i've been told it's not comparable to normal dmt dimethyltryptamine which is also part of the ayahuasca brew that you that you drink it's completely different it's really short cycled right it's really fast and it's really like a rocket people if you listen to michael pollan explaining it on a, on a podcast like yeah i was f- i felt like i was strapped onto a rocket and it just shot me into space and i was no way i could hold back it was just off we go no chance 
the letting go part happens because you cannot manage to to hold on to anything. It just it just shoots you out there. Maybe you can explain a little bit what happened to you because this this experience itself had a pretty profound impact on what happened after after that with you and your life. Yeah. Yeah, and I um I know lots of people or not lots. I know many people who have worked with five and I haven't met anyone yet who has had the same experiences as me. And some the recent a recent explanation I heard for that was something about the nervous system being overwhelmed. So mm -hmm. maybe my nervous system is getting more overwhelmed than other people's. And so But I think the initial experience is very similar, which has to do with, I think the word that keeps coming up for me is dissolving. So, mm -hmm. and cause I get, a, I do, I get a lot of reactivation. So that's where I feel like I'm not completely, I'm not special or anything. Just, this is just my experience that I don't meet a lot of other people that have had it, but I, cause I have experienced the medicine. So the first time I did it, I did it three times with Chad Charles and um, I've spoken, all the people that have served me, I've spoken to them ahead of time to request their permission so that other people can look them up as resources if they're mm -hmm. interested and people can also feel free to contact me. But, um, so I went to a retreat and for me, there's what happens in each specific journey. And then there's what happens because I've had all these reactivations. So not sleeping for a week and then that's filled with, um, People call it reactivations, night school. And I think I think an older term for it might be flashback. I think that's sort of a, a similar thing. So this experience of dissolving is very profound. And my very first time experiencing it, there was resistance. There was the no, no, no. And, um, and that fear and And then actually in a one integration session, someone said, where have you experienced that fear before? And I do feel like in my childhood, my childhood was filled with fear and lots of nightmares. And so there was some resonance there with that. But um, then once the, once there's the surrender, which now I really work with this, I often say to myself, surrender gracefully. And, and I bring that into um, cold water uh, immersion. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, I am able to allow this experience of, it's like floating and it's very ethereal and oneness, peace, love, bliss. Bliss is another word that comes a lot. And, um, and for me, I grew up within agnostic dad and a not much church in my life and when I the little bits of church I experienced and what I knew of God like I didn't really know what God was and I've just always sort of into my 20s and 30s was like well I really resonate with nature and I don't know much beyond that and um and so for me this was like oh this is God I get it and it wasn't And then even it was, I find it kind of funny for myself because I wasn't seeking God that I, or not consciously seeking God. And because for me, I guess growing up in our culture, God was associated with all these various religions and it was just very confusing and not very enticing um, mm -hmm. to uh, know God. Um, and then um, even in my reactivations, I was having full body orgasms and just, just having a lot going on, seeing maybe auras and just in my daily life, having all these experiences. And I have a very, um, I have a life where don't, I'm in a new community. I don't know a lot of people. So living alone. So not a lot of people to talk to about what was happening for me. And um, finally, I did ask Chad, like, can you just th kind of throw me a bone of what's going on? And he said, well, try this book called Psychology is a Spiritual Awakening. And then I was like, spiritual awakening. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I started Googling that. I was like, oh, that's what's going on. And I almost had this stigma around the word spiritual. Like, even though I have said to people I'm spiritual, just, yeah. And now I was like, oh, okay, this is all making so much more sense. And again, not, not necessarily that I'm special because anyone can experience this, but just that, just that this has not been part of my culture and my education and my upbringing. And so, yeah, I just feel, actually feel really grateful for spirituality. And so, and all the, 
self-help work I've done up to this point, I feel like it's been lacking spirituality. Mm -hmm. And for me now, that is such a key part of my offering and my what is being offered to me. Wow. Similar in my case and to a lot of people I've talked to with kind of an atheist mindset beforehand and then having had those such a profound experience might change their viewpoint on what they believe there is something like a higher force or something when we when we talk about that spirituality context and a lot of people have this reluctant kind of adversity towards the word itself spirituality like uh, god all of this esoteric bullshit and like come on because you can't cope with the real world you need to escape to the spiritual side of things and like in your case to me it's different if you've experienced it firsthand it's more of a kind of a guiding system or mechanism that all that helps you anchoring everything that you're doing day to day in a more trustworthy manner i would say or more being more aligned with what you are here to do and then when we talk about having mystical experiences well, when people talk about this and then having you know seen yourself from another perspective you know out of this normal 3d world and then some people would call it higher self or whatever and then knowing that this exists and you've seen it and then coming back to to what you've done before and uh always having this kind of in in the back of your mind like oh i've seen it i've grasped it i've experienced it that's why somatic experiencing so so powerful i felt it in my whole body and system and now what to do with this it, it It doesn't leave me it's still even though it's been a long time ago i can't forget it like it's not like a vacation i've done five years ago and i remember oh it was in south of france and it was beautiful i think there was a beach and I, it's it's even though you can't remember details it just still stays with you on a more deeper level it's hard to explain but a major shift normally happens to people and this has an impact to my personal experience on how i see myself in the world working as a person that is here to do more than just live i'm here to actually give back to serve to use my abilities to my best knowledge to help others to contribute to something larger than myself and this is where this whole fulfillment aspect of what we do here comes in and i was lacking a lot of that in my previous job was where's the fulfillment part of all of this i can just follow what everyone else is doing like okay well job is not fulfilling well then just get a wife and kids that'll be fulfilling you've never experienced such a thing in your life before because only if you're a parent you know why it's like okay i, I get this yeah and hopefully it will, will come to a point eventually where i can also give back in that way but to me it never felt right to just do this as another means of well i don't know what what i'm here to do but well kids make sense so let's just focus on that for now there was always something inside of me that kept kind of wanting to come out and telling me to do just look within the answers are all within and then not hide and don't be afraid of what you might find because there's a lot of shadow in there but just go in and trust and then you'll find and like you mentioned before synchronicities and then just as long as you're aligned with what your truth is and you have to figure out what that truth is for for yourself right but your own truth and then live up to that day by day and just trust in that everything else will fall into your lap kind of you know the universe whatever will law of attraction will will take take care of the rest just follow your truth and live up to that day to day and then trust in that process and this will ultimately lead you to a more fulfilled and well-being in in life basically is that how you feel since you had this experience as well even though you had mountain climbing like i said it's not an office job where you see like fuck me it's just gonna shoot myself day to day but yeah, yeah you know what i mean but, but i think no matter what job you have like i feel like you can do it in following your truth or you can do it and not. And I, I think this whole idea of following your truth, like it, they're just words. And our, in, for me, our culture doesn't teach us how to follow our own truth. It's like one of these much easier said than done kind of things because yeah. no one's, who's teaching us that. And I, I guess religions are aiming to teach us that. And then unfortunately I feel like I just got turned off religion and even Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. So I do think there is some guidance out there, but yeah, but I guess just showing up on this planet. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's interesting. How do we, it's all part of the thing is how do we find our own truth? It's just a very, 
but you're right. So that is, and now that's also part of my journey is how do I continue to do that? Like, I still question it. Like I still, I'll probably question nursing school until I graduate because it's not very easy mm-hmm. um, and fun as much fun as it is doing this podcast. <laughs> um, or like, I just get lost in rabbit holes every day on the internet on yes. really fascinating topics. Um and my mom is like, okay, you're a, like, you want to learn, but you just need to learn nursing school right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, yes, I do think that my goal is to learn how to follow my truth. And yeah. that's like, that's my, and I, so that's why meditation, I daily meditation is so potent for me. And mm. I guess this is talking about integration, really, because that's what's powerful about psychedelics. They can show you maybe what's possible or show you, they can show you something. And it's like, if you haven't seen that, you don't believe it exists or you don't know what's there. And it's like, where do I point my compass? So it's mm-hmm. like, it gives you something to point towards, but then it's like, and then what does that look like? Or what does my daily life look like that can help me point me towards that? And so that's part of that following your truth. So I do think meditation is a big part of that and, and the, all the heart centered stuff. So I guess I wanted to mention that um, quite a few things actually <laughs> that I've worked with some other substances like three MMC yes. and, and mm-hmm. did a training with that. And that's very heart centered and with Shuma mm-hmm. is also very heart centered. And cause I do feel like those are really important places to go to find our heart because I feel like for me, like at the end of this um, journey, another five journey I did, some a facilitator said to me, do you feel your heart? And in that moment, I was like, no, I don't. I don't feel my heart. And, and I do think we get disconnected from our hearts. I think, I think that's part of our culture does disconnect it because it's, for me, it's too, it can be too painful to be connected to it because it's like, well, then I would be heartbroken because I can't have everything my heart wants. And so, yeah. So I think for me, there's a reconnection to the heart that's happening through this work. That's so true. And um, yeah, the heart doesn't help you execute a business where you face adversity day to day, right? The heart might be in the way of, you know, performing and hustling and, you know, doing all of this great stuff that you're supposed to do. But like you, like you say, and so beautifully, show now is this we're here to in my understanding it's the combination of both the mind and the heart connection and to me what psychedelics like no other tool helped me actually accomplish is getting that connection set up again i know i've always you know craved more of this connection but i had no idea how to make that string somehow this helped me like nothing else and i can only imagine what happened when you talk about integration but you you said that 2006 was probably mo- the most traumatic year and like it's such a traumatic year for you when you lost your dad in a car accident but did the 5 meu experience or any other that you mentioned help you with that the grieving part the loss of your dad the trauma that came through that if and if yes how how did it help you how do you feel changed or different through that yeah so I like that you asked this question because for me it highlights because that happened 2006 and then I didn't do 5-MeO till January 2020. So it's mm. only been a year really. And um, so in that time, I do feel like because of all the different sort of my own seeking and desire to know myself better or heal myself, I I learned to be with grief. So I think just allowing grief in my life and I'm passionate about helping people with loss before psychedelics. Like I'm have gone to grief circles and death cafes. And I, I wanted to, uh, before just during COVID, I was about to host a kind of a death cafe for the mountain guides, because I think it's not okay to talk about death mm-hmm. in lots of places. So we need safe places to do that. But, um, but then five working with five, actually, I do have, still have a lot of questions about my dad's death and, so my dad did show up a little bit, not as much, not, it was more about my mom and my sisters actually in my first journey. But um, in some of the reactivations, I feel like I experienced some of my dad's death. And I think the way it brought me comfort was um, 
was through experiencing that release into bliss and love and knowing mm. that that is part of the death experience and knowing that um i mean even before i did psychedelics i was having a kin what is part of continuing bonds theory so i learned to have a relationship with my dad um outside of the physical mm -hmm. um but i think it's been strengthened with psychedelics in that i feel i just feel like my growing confidence in what we can't see and energy through the exploration of psychedelics and meditation is helping me to feel closer to things that i can't see oh, that makes so much sense and like you mentioned before for people that have not experienced it it's hard to understand because you've never experienced it obviously but also because a lot of what you exp do experience there it's even if you've experienced it it's hard to explain to others because it's so foreign to us sometimes words are not needed to explain what happens and just listening to what you just share and just feeling feeling that is way more valuable than than words in that case to me and it shows truth again in that in that way so thank you for that um thank you a lot when you compare because you you said that 2020 was the first time you did 5meo and it was 14 years in between since 2006 to now wow a long time of you know working with grief working with that loss going to therapy doing all of, all of those other modalities that you mentioned and then you had the 5meo experience is it possible for you to com compare even if it's hard maybe but you know what the difference is from that experience to the 14 years you did beforehand to work on right. the same topic yeah. yeah i love actually i love this metaphor chad charles gives which is you get into this elevator and you ride it up and every floor the elevator doors open and you see a different perspective and so one floor could be having children And then what perspective that gives you. And then another floor could be getting kicked out of nursing school mm. and what perspective that gives you or losing your father, losing your child, you know, and that all these things give us a new perspective on life, getting, falling in love, you know, so taking 5-MEO. And so it's a new window and a new perspective. And it's a pretty mind blowing perspective, <laughs> you know, to be in a way lifted out of three-dimensional consciousness mm -hmm. <laughs> and shown something but then it's really hard to what do you do with that when you come back onto the planet like I actually didn't enjoy feeling like I wasn't on the planet like I'm I recently said wrote to someone like I I love non-ordinary states of consciousness but they're making me appreciate ordinary states of consciousness that much more like I, it makes me want to just figure out what is it to be human and to be in an ordinary state of consciousness and to make that filled with love and sort of just really make the most of this um, experience on the planet. <clears throat> Cause like non-ordinary states are amazing, but they're just um, for me, they're just a tool mm -hmm. to help my perspective for being here present And how do I get through an ordinary day? Um, and what what do I value in this ordinary life? Like, what is most important? And so, so the question of the 14 years versus a weekend of 5-MEO, mm -hmm. I definitely, coming out of that weekend, I felt in flow in a way that I rarely felt ever before. And I try to... Like I try to bring that flow into my life as best I can, but I can't be on 5-MEO all the time and I wouldn't want to be. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, it's just all about, yeah, like taking that thing and figuring out how to bring it into this without using that. <laughs> and yeah, I find it interesting because we have, I have so much ego around different, different things, you know, it's like, well, what is, there's not just one thing that makes us, heal but um i definitely think they're the catalyst of psychedelics can be really healing but they can also be very full on so i guess i've also had some full-on places and so the whole bad trip thing so for me 
I, I, I do agree with the sentiment that there's sort of not a bad trip if you're mm-hmm. open to learning about it, but I also have had some really challenging experiences and I am someone who likes challenge, but not everyone likes challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and so and not everyone's ready for challenge maybe, or doesn't have the resources to handle it or whatever. So I guess there is that too. Like I, I'm not going to do, I don't know when I'm going to do five next or whatever substance. Um, There's definitely a synchronicity to when that shows up in my life and when I'm ready for it. Like um, I can't, I can't lose a week of, like for me, I lose like a week of sleep, which is not normal. I don't want, I don't know people <laughs> to know that that is not normal. Um, and I'm grateful for these big experiences I have and they show me a lot, but they're not something I'm going to do on, like on the regular. <laughs> so it's the five, you did five MEO 2020 and you said that nursing school was kind of the, the lead up to, okay, you rediscovered or discovered the research that's happening on the use of psychedelics. I don't know Canada is also on the forefront next to the States when it comes to psilocybin working with for depression and PTSD. And I mean, you guys are also in the top bracket of the leading pack, I would say, working with that. So was it then that this 5-MEO experience and potentially others following and the the research that's happening combined with what you've experienced so far in your life and just the knowing that somatic experiencing to me helped reshape everything that I've experienced in a way that I can better live with my traumatic past to bring you to a point where you now dream of bringing both of those elements together, if I understood you correctly, right? To, to kind of merge both, both parties into a therapeutic system that is, I'm not sure if it's already existing, but uh, if not, maybe you want to, want to touch that a little bit on what what your current roadmap looks like yeah it's exciting it's really exciting so i did do this training with sasha cuff um at the sentinel in Mm -hmm. near caslow bc and so 3mmc is similar to mdma so doing that style so the map style of training where Mm -hmm. you have the two um, practitioners and the one client and you have a pre-session uh like a seven to nine hour session and then a post-session so it's kind of almost like a three-day event and Mm -hmm. then that incorporated the somatics and then i'm also really excited about the psychedelic somatic institute and they're also combining somatic with psychedelics so and actually what's exciting about their work is that they're going to use, they're using different substances, but one substance they're using is cannabis. And then the session is like two hours and you go and mm-hmm. work with the free state. And so to work, do that work in such a short time, um, I find it exciting and working with the free state seems really profound, like profound work for shifting things in us. And um, there's some things I want to say here. Anyways, I've been, I feel like I've, I've got a community of people that I'm, we're working together. So we're um, I'm learning from each other and practicing with each other. And so that's quite exciting. And then um, it's also interesting that Numinous out of Vancouver is starting to do research, use, um, partnered with MAPS to start to do research. So that's something that's sort of in my vicinity. That's also really exciting in terms of the work that's going to be done. I guess for me, I do see that this work is really profound when you develop a relationship with someone who gets to know you and you develop trust with them. And then there's sort of like, you learn how to do somatic work. So you learn how to tune in to sensation and Mm -hmm. allowing and noticing. Because I think actually that's, there's a lot about allowing in this work. And if you, we do so much to prevent ourselves from allowing experience, like by overthinking, over talking, um, distraction, like when things get uncomfortable, moving away from them instead of moving towards them. So there's something about learning how to move towards and allowing and being curious about what's showing up. So just being in an observational state and, and then being able to follow that, Mm -hmm. that really, so a lot of times when we go into this work, We set our attentions, which are great. Like we, and sometimes the intentions aren't so much like 
I want to be a certain way or it's more like um, I want to be open to what shows up. That's the intention. I want to be, I want to be gentle with myself can be an amazing intention. I want to do this gently. And then just, there's a lot of sort of allowing and noticing and then bringing in some of the top down stuff, but just the bottom up stuff is all the sort of the nurturing container, the loving, whatever shows up, we're going to love it and we're going to honor it and recognize that it's important because it came up. And so we want to honor all these parts of ourselves that show up in these sessions. I'm mm -hmm. just all over the place. Sorry. Oh, good. That's beautiful. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. And uh, so when I picture Jen's life in a couple of years, does that look like you're helping people not just climb mountains and experience the beauty of the world from that angle, but also help them go inwards and help them with somatic work, potentially using plant medicine or psychedelics. Is that something that you picture yourself doing? Combining? Yeah. yeah. I have this amazing, I actually it was cool because I went to the ceremony. I don't know. And am I, and I was like, what is my purpose? <laughs> <laughs> I just do want to share this, this vision that came up. I do get lots of different visions though. So I'm not getting too attached to anyone, but this one really excites me. Yes, for me in a couple of years, I definitely see myself as a as a qualified nurse working with psychedelics with people in British Columbia. So that's very exciting as one aspect of my life. Um, but I also have this more entrepreneurial vision, which I'm excited about because I've always resist the entrepreneurial life. And um, it involves training people who are mountain guides, um, having ceremonialists, um, maybe healthcare professionals, potentially, and then lodge staff. So people who own the lodge and mm -hmm. provide cooking and all that kind of stuff. And then providing an experience to guests where you could go for a week in the mountains, um, backcountry skiing or hiking or climbing, and but you're there for personal development. And so you're there to experience nature and have a wonderful experience that way. And no substances are used while participating in skiing or climbing or whatever. But part of the experience in the lodge environment, in the safe container, is to also have a medicine ceremony and or two and to work with the staff that's there on your own stuff. And in a group context, I really think group work is amazing work. And yeah. So that's my vision. And I think that launching this vision of like training the guides and the ceremonialists and the healthcare professionals and the lodge staff, I think that would be um, amazing too. Like just the whole thing. So. Well, it just, it doesn't just excite you, but just listening to it. <laughs> um, well, we incorporate the integration part of it, uh, the integration element right there. Right? Right. When, you leave, when you leave the lodge and just go on, on the second part of it. Um, wow. Beautiful. Is there something like that already that's existent i've never heard of it i'm not aware of it but i do feel like i could put something like that together in a very sort of small way mm -hmm. right now but my vision is quite big Baker, yeah. but yeah i do feel like i think in the closer term i could do some sort of um yeah maybe underground smaller version of that but well isn't that another great um, reason why to continue doing nursing school even though it's a pain in the ass to get yes. that thing done and out of the way I know totally <laughs> how many more years yeah. do you have there uh two more two yeah, more. yeah it's, it's, do <laughs> it's doable you can you can do it just two thank more thank you but yeah having that in mind and thinking okay it's it makes a lot of sense not all of it but parts of it do make a lot of sense so having that in the bucket as well and then kind of exploring that vision not on a big scheme but maybe starting small because everyone has to do a first step right everything starts on a small scale i could just imagine that this is such a beautiful shared experience like you said in a group context like a group of i don't know how mm -hmm. large your groups might be then but just having this set up at the, from the get-go and then you start at the bottom you want to go to the top and in between there's so much excitement happening and then in those large settings with the local people as well potentially and then creating that safe container for them and then going on to the next part of that journey which is then just 
you know, reaching the, the summit at one point, standing on top of the mountain, which was your initial goal, starting the whole quest, but then standing there looking down and thinking, wow, I got so much more out of this than just being on the top of that mountain. And it just symbolically stands for so much more. And then just this, oh, this moment for people to experience standing there, then, wow, this is, I'd sign up for it. I can tell you. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, beautiful. Are you already doing like starting working on this, or is it just recently came up and a uh, li little bit more time is needed? Yeah, just a seed. Just a seed. And I need yeah, and I need lots of people who are smarter than me with um, with creating a business. Yes. <laughs> There's plenty yeah. of them around. Plenty of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Amazing. I mean. With all of your previous experience and everything that you lived through and that you had to endure and um, come across in your own life, I mean, you can only imagine how much you can give to people that not only people that are facing a loss in their life or going through a grieving phase, but just in general, combining those techniques and tools that you are able to already now offer to people just so so beautiful to imagine that you can do this and you will do this kind of work which will be so healing and helpful for a lot of people and whenever i talk to people about this topic i need to calm myself down otherwise i'll just you know be too excited about it um no. but then but then, <laughs> <laughs> but then talking to people like you that are actually aiming towards that direction in a working Uh, relationship as well want to incorporate those tools in the way they do their work this is even more exciting because talking from practitioner to practitioner is like oh yeah i feel you i mean that will be great i can't imagine all the whole thing it's like it's yeah you get a sign from me on that vision it's a, <laughs> it's a solid one <laughs> thank you <laughs> definitely yeah beautiful is there anything i think that just comes to mind now because that was such a beautiful arc of of the conversation but you mentioned that you had quite a few experiences with psychedelics but are there any others that stick out that that you might might highlight or want to highlight for people in interested in that field yeah i guess um i mean we all come from a different desire so some people want to do a lot of work by themselves but i've done only i think there's different yeah anyways once i took a large dose of mushrooms by myself and it was hard and i got a friend on the phone who helped me through it and um definitely just made me realize that because i don't know if there's some maybe it's just me but there's some pressure about what this needs to look like or what mm -hmm. you know something like that and it just i guess i just want to say to people it doesn't have to it can be gentle and kind and loving and supportive and you, you don't have to go do something crazy by yourself or crazy in any way there's no pressure for this like like there's there's a calling to it there can be a gentleness to it and um it can be quite supportive and loving yeah and even with my hard experiences because i think even in hard experiences if there's people in the room there's still like a very you're the person experiencing it so um, just I just encourage, I'm so grateful for myself that I've reached out to people to get help with interpreting some of my experiences or getting support with it. So I just, I think that there's such a community growing in on the internet and around the globe and that there's so many ways to get support with our experiences. And I, and I would love to support other people with their experiences too. So if I'm seeing like a good resource for someone who's listening to this, please reach out. And yeah, it just, just, I feel like in general, there's this loneliness or aloneness on the planet, like an epidemic of it. And so just to know, and it's almost like, I love hearing myself say this, like I am not alone because I spend a lot of time alone. <laughs> so it's just connecting with you and knowing that other people might hear this. It makes me feel less alone. So yeah. thank you. Well, thank you. And that's one of the most beautiful elements of psilocybin for instance are working with with those type of substances is the interconnectedness the felt interconnectedness of all things of all living things beings this whole community aspect of i'm a tiny part of the larger parts that form the whole everything and that feeling shared feeling with people to experience in a group setting yes it's the reason why most people say they've never experienced such a profound 
thing in their life before. It's it's so beautiful, um, done in the right way. And just to close that off, I think um, encouragement is 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 good for people that like what you just said you don't have to have a horrible experience it doesn't have to be this way whatever you might have heard before um, every journey is individual no one can you know foresee what will happen what not but it doesn't have to be hard it can be loving and gentle and kind and all of that or in a combination of of two of those but in the end eventually what i found personally is that they help me in any way like the hard ones the same way as the the less harder ones and I will not want to miss one of them right so just looking at them as as other tools to combine the mind with the heart getting from the cognitive level to the more somatic experience and then having this as a combinational uh, experiential feeling is is something I would wish for everyone to experience once in their life so the opportunity to share conversations with you on on this podcast hopefully someone will listen to this and then find the courage to explore this in a way which is safe for them and in with the, the appropriate circumstances for them which which sounds okay to them um, with the appropriate tool and then to make that kind of explorative leap into the unknown and find that like Terence McKenna says it's a feather bed and yeah thank you so much for your for your journey is there something which i normally ask at the end of the recording if you had a chance to go back 2020 before your first 5meo experience and give yourself a, a tip one thing that you could tell your younger self what would that be right before going in be curious and be kind to myself and um you just listen to yourself so there's no like no pressure um, or something. And I, I didn't, I, I guess I, I did embody those things in that experience. And that was really helpful. And one thing that stands out actually for me is that one day we were told that we couldn't, couldn't leave the property. And, mm -hmm. but I, it was in California and I'm from Canada and I just <laughs> was like, I need to go to the ocean. Like I not, not coming all the way here not going to the ocean. So I, I went to the ocean and jumped in the ocean and it was, it was exactly what I needed and it was wonderful. And um, so I just think this, it's just so important to listen to those quiet voices inside of us that guide us to do um, wonderful things for ourselves. And just speaking, I know, I don't know where all the audiences that'll be listening to this, but um there's a association called the Canadian Psychedelic Association and they have sort of monthly online gatherings and that's a really good place to, a really good network to tap into in Canada. Amazing. And for, for whoever wants to have a guided mountain experience with you when they're in Canada, is there, what's the way to reach you? What's the best way to reach you? Um, I think the best way is by email and okay. Okay. my email or like social media so instagram mm -hmm. i'm wholesome 71 on instagram and jen olson j-e-n-o-l-s-o-m is if you google me you'll find me perfect we'll link everything in the show notes so they can find you whenever the homepage is done we'll link that as well so <laughs> let me know whenever that happened great um, thank you yeah it's gonna be i just put it on hold for another couple months i'm trying to learn how to do less things so yes that was one of them yeah <laughs> good, good point all, all of us yep. need to learn that more and more um yeah. well beautiful thank you so much jen for that for that exploration of your journey and everything that you encountered so far all the lessons that you learned and that you already shared with people thank you so much and Al yeah, Alex, thank you so much for providing this opportunity to show up and be, take a risk, be vulnerable, share, and um, sharing your own experiences and being a person that's easy to connect with. So, thank you. So, so, so happy to do this. So thank you so much. And um, well, now enjoy the snow, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Powder <laughs> skiing. Yes, enjoy that. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Thank bye you. Bye. bye. bye.